Welcome to today's Capital Markets Series event on real estate, hosted by CFA Society of Chicago's Education Seminars Advisory Group. This is the fourth part of our Capital Markets Series. Replays of the previous events are available on the Society's website and our YouTube channel. Recaps are available on the Society's blog. Information on upcoming events can be found on the Society's website at www.cfachicago.org. I'm Chris Vincent, CEO of the Society. All mics for attendees will automatically be muted during the event. If you have a question for our panel, please use the Q&A feature. This event is being recorded. Today's discussion will be moderated by Danny Kaufman, Senior Managing Director and Co-Head of the Chicago Office JLL Capital Markets Americas. Danny has more than 20 years of commercial real estate experience, and he specializes in all areas of commercial real estate finance with a focus on real estate investment banking and equity debt placement. Joining Danny for today's discussion are Emmy Adachi, Senior Vice President and Deputy Director of North American Investment Research at Heitman, Brad Grease, America's co-CIO and head of U.S. transactions at LaSalle, and Michael Nigro, managing director and head of real estate value add and development for the Americas at DWS. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Danny. Chris, thank you very much. Um, just given my uh, Panel, panel mates a moment to uh, turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. But Chris, thank you very much for, uh, for introducing us here today. Uh, very, very grateful to, uh, to be here. Um, you know, as, as you sort of led, we're gonna uh, have a panel today really focused on the real estate capital markets. And because it's so hard to separate the real estate capital markets from sort of the broader commercial real estate trends, uh, we will also obviously be touching on some of the key trends that are covering uh, the real estate market more broadly today, both uh, here in Chicago as well as on a, a national basis. So you'll, you'll hear us talk about a lot of those things. Um, we all know each other. It's a very sort of tight-knit industry. And so we all know each other on this panel. You'll probably see us banter about a little bit and interrupt one another, but it's, it's just because we know each other and we're pretty darn comfortable with one another at, at this point. So hopefully, um, you know, all, all of you in the audience can do the same thing as it relates to, you know, post your questions, we'll save some time at the end and we'll answer as many of those questions as we possibly have time for. Uh, we promise to not use any cat filters on this uh, presentation. So leave all that to the side, but you know, in the audience, you're welcome to do that. Uh, so what I think we should do just um, uh, quickly is introduce, uh, let, allow everyone that's on this panel to quickly introduce themselves and may, maybe say something interesting about themselves personally. Uh, I can lead off. Uh, my name is Danny Kaufman. I, I uh, live here in the city of Chicago with uh, my wife and two little daughters. Uh, from a personal perspective, I've got the best eight-year-old piano players in the city of Chicago whose names are Hannah and Isabel Kaufman. So that's the, the qualifier. And maybe with that, I'll hand it off to Emmy if you want to lead us off and we'll go around the horn. Sure. Hi, I'm Emmy Adachi with Heitman in the Investment Research Group. Um, I'm a native Chicagoan. I've been at Heitman for 14 years, which is my whole career so far. And I have a three-year-old son named Nico. That's it. Mike, you wanna have at it? Great, yeah, thanks, Danny. Hi, I'm Mike Nigro. Um, I run development on behalf of the Reef business, which is part of uh, DWS Asset Management. Uh, on the personal side, I'm kind of a, a dirt dog. I spend a lot of time on the baseball diamond and uh, help out with our, um, our local youth baseball. You're a dirt dog and a dirt dog. You, you play you. baseball and you like development. It's very apt. You should get dirt squared on your license plate. Here you go. Brad. Yeah, thanks, uh, Danny. Uh, I'm Brad Grease. Uh, I uh, am with LaSalle Investment Management. I uh, run our U.S. transactions business as well as uh, co-run our uh, uh, CIO function directing strategy for LaSalle. In the Americas, um, also a lifelong Chicagoan, uh, bounced between the suburbs and the city. Um, I have two teenage kids, um, and uh, I uh, graduate of the University of Illinois. Hopefully, there's some Illini on the line. Go Illini! Um, so yeah, that's it. 
Excellent. Well, I think with that, why don't we kick it off and get into our, our discussion? Um, and Brad, maybe you could uh, kick us off, you know, given sort of your role as, as CIO at, at, at LIM, you're obviously interfacing with quite a few of your investor clients, you know, on a very regular basis. How are you, how are you advising them? What are you telling them to be focused on? And I think it's actually a good broad question that other, the rest of the panelists can chime in on as well. Sure. It is a good question. And I think the answer is it sort of depends on the investor and what, uh, what their appetite is for risk. Um, so if you just sort of, uh, segment it between what we would consider core risk and, uh, and higher risk or higher risk and higher return. Uh, for core investors, we're really advising them to uh, invest now, uh, given the relative value in, in real estate uh, versus the alternatives that they have uh, in the low interest rate environment, we think makes uh, investing dollars today uh, that much more valuable. Um, we're also advising clients to the extent that they uh, have the capacity to modestly increase leverage to take advantage of the current interest rate environment. That could be, uh, you know, flowing rate debt uh, or locking in long-term uh, fixed rate financing. Um, from a, uh, an asset class standpoint, um, we definitely are advising our clients to uh to lean into the industrial sector uh, and take risk uh, in the industrial sector. So we're, you know, we're investing from core all the way out through development uh, and taking advantage of the tailwinds uh, in, in that sector. Um, we also think that residential investments and not, not just your traditional uh, for rent multifamily investments, but some alternatives in that space uh, that have some nice fundamentals tailwinds uh, are a, a nice place to uh, to put core money. And then I'd say we're advising them to be a little bit cautious on office and retail. I think there's some secular uh, changes and uncertainty, uh, which means risk uh, around those sectors. And uh, you either need to be able to uh, quantify that risk uh, and then get paid a return on it. Uh, and I think that's that's difficult to do right now. So um, we're, you know, we're advising our clients to be cautious uh, within those two sectors as well. And maybe before we get sort of the research perspective on that, just for this audience, Brad, you, you referenced the alternatives, which, you know, at, at JLL, we sort of re refer to as the, uh, the other, one of the four major asset classes at this point. Maybe just what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, it, it can mean different things to different folks, but in the institutional uh, universe, that could mean uh, something like self-storage or uh, medical office real estate, uh, healthcare real estate in general. I was specifically referring to alternatives in the residential uh, sector, which can include uh, active adults and can include uh, a really growing segment right now, which is single family uh, for rent residential. Um, so those are just a handful of, of the you know, kind of non-primary or food group segments. Yeah, and for, for the audience, that's become a, a really big part of the conversation as it relates to real estate investing today is looking for alternative investment types outside of the four major food groups, office, industrial, multi-housing, and retail. I mean, how, just out of curiosity, how, from a research perspective, how does that line up to how you're, you're thinking about the world on the Heitman side? Yeah, it's very similar from a sector perspective. So I think you'll hear a lot of the same themes come out of this discussion. And that's part of what makes it tough, right? Because there's a lot of capital looking to go into the same sectors and a lot of capital not looking at certain sectors. So we've had we have a couple of themes that we've been telling to our investors recently. So echoing Brad, um, you know, now is probably a good time to make a lot of investments. Early in recoveries tends to be a good time. Um, in those in favor sectors, whether it's industrial, residential, some of the non traditionals or alternatives, um, we kind of have two themes. So, in ones where we have really high conviction and kind of a strong track record of experience, like self storage or medical office, we think it's even though there's lots of capital coming in and pricing is pretty rich, we think it's still a good time to keep investing because there's continued runway for growth. There is a lot of money that's interested in some of these newer sectors like life sciences and data centers. And in those where we don't feel like we have quite as much conviction yet, and we don't know the markets as well. And in many cases, it's a pretty small investable universe. And we're kind of advising just have patience with these in favor sectors because there's so much money trying to flow into them. And then finally, I would just say again, with those out of favor sectors like office and retail, 
uh, be patient, but we're always looking out, you know, for those opportunities and, and hoping, you know, looking to see when the time is right to make some kind of move. Yeah, very interesting. You know, the, the, the sort of two logical paths for entry into, you know, commercial real estate is, you know, the, the private markets, which we're primarily talking about right now as it relates to the background of this panel. And then there's the public markets, the REIT vehicles. And we had a, I thought a really interesting conversation, uh, you know, in preparation for this panel, comparing some of those correlations and some of the returns on the, uh, the NIC REIT index versus the REIT indices. Mike, I think you had some interesting, you know, commentary on that. It might be interesting to share, you know, given that a lot of the members of this audience are probably focused on the public uh, markets. Yeah, I mean, the public markets, obviously, with, you know, being able to, being liquid and being able to, you know, trade daily, so incredible, you know, volatility at the onset of COVID with um, with some of the stocks and that the publicly traded stocks tend to be a sector specific. So you saw you know, some retail stocks down by as much as, you know, 45%. Uh, private real estate, we call ill liquid because, you know, you can't just sell it overnight. Um, and so the reality was, Whereas everybody expected there to be significant devaluation, you know, in our world and in the, in the direct private real estate world, actually ended up being a pretty decent year, um, you know, on, on the aggregate. Uh, obviously, hospitality um, took a big hit, down as much as 25% um, uh, in the Odyssey index. And retail, um, you ended up being down about 7%, which is more tempered than you would think. Um, uh, and then institutional, which has been, I'm sorry, industrial, which has been the best performer over the past five years, uh, ended up year end having about a 14% year. So, you know, that gives you an idea as to what the returns look like by sector type in our, in our world. But the, that disparity between that dispersion of 14% on industrial versus minus seven on, on, on retail is a very large, maybe even the largest by historical standards. Yeah, I think, but interesting to note that the uh, degree of dispersion within amongst uh, sort of returns and immediate response to the COVID pandemic, they were much more pronounced, you know, within the public markets, um, yes. uh, you know, as a relate, relative to, you know, what investors saw, institutional investors saw in the private markets or private owners in the private markets. And, and Brad, you had some good comments, I think, on that as it relates to correlation. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is a lot of people will seek investments in the public REIT sectors, uh, you know, looking for exposure to real estate um, and thinking that that is uh, more correlated to private real estate and less correlated to the broader public market. But that's just not the case. The, the uh, REIT sector is more correlated to other uh, public market indices. And that's one of the great uh, benefits of private real estate is uh, that it doesn't track uh, the, the public equity markets and the volatility that Mike just mentioned. Uh, that's not just this, this past year. You can look at that volatility measure over the last 20, 30 years of private real estate versus, uh, versus the public REIT market or the overall public market. Um, and uh, if you view volatility as risk, um, then evaluate private real estate on a risk adjusted basis. And it looks it looks pretty pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually a fairly good segue to you know one of those next major topics. You know, the we talk about volatility and we talk about degrees of risk, and it it does seem like everything has shifted to uh, hyperbolic conversations these days. It's you know it's either perfect or it's the worst or it's the best or et cetera et cetera. We we do seem like we're completely inundated right now with hyperbole and. You know, I, I wonder if, I, I was just curious for the group's perspective as to how have we come to this, you know, a bunch of, you know, very mature uh, investment professionals and everyone's talking in absolutes now. Curious if anyone had some thoughts on that and how we put it to bed and put it to rest. Well, it's, been coined the, it's been coined the great accelerator and we're in warp speed right now. And um, so we're, we're uh, you know, we're facing the G-force there, but that once we get back to normal, um, you look. You you look at um, you look at retail as an example, which is easy to point to, um, and you sort of say, look, that the, the, we were over. You know, we have more square footage than we would need. There's certainly we saw with the department stores, and we've seen with certain uh, retailers, you know, a, a, a slow slow decline, uh, and this just sort of hit the fast forward button on that. But separately, you know, there are some. Um, outperformers in, in retail too. I mean, grocery stores are doing terrific, pharmacies doing terrific, 
liquor stores have, happen to be doing well. Um, so, you know, and, and this country is going to go back to shopping, food and beverage restaurants were doing really well going into this. People are going to go back to, back to restaurants. So it's not going to be this, this total demise. Um, you know, and then related to that, you know, uh, people still want to live by amenities and retail. Um, there's definitely been an acceleration of sort of migration, um, both from urban to suburban and then, and then certain geographic shifts that people are really paying attention to. So I think those factors are playing into people's psyche. Yeah. What is your first? Oh, go ahead, Brad. Go ahead, Danny. Please. I was just going to say the hyperbole that I hear in these absolutes uh, revolve around sort of three things. And it all, it, it's all about death, the death of the mall, the death of the office building and the death of the city. Um, now there definitely are malls that are dying and should die and they should be redeveloped into something else. Um, but the other two uh, are, and that, and that began well before uh, COVID. Um, the other two are more COVID induced uh, hyperbole and it's just, I don't understand why people go to those absolutes. Maybe it's just to create some alarm or, you know, to make some headlines. But the reality is, um, you know, people are going to come back to the office uh, when it's safe to do so and when they feel comfortable, maybe not everybody. Um, and for the reasons that Mike mentioned, uh, the amenities and uh, both from a entertainment and a culture standpoint are going to bring people back to the cities. Um, there's been a long trend of urbanization that, uh, that's been occurring, uh, and, and that'll come back, I think, when, uh, when it feels safe to be in a dense environment like that again. I mean, what are you seeing in the data as it relates to some of these larger trends from, a, uh, you know, population migration perspective, um, suburban to urban or otherwise? Yeah, so I would actually point, you know, back to the last cycle pre-COVID because this kind of clickbait, right, media culture was already prevalent then and everyone wanted to have this really strong narrative. And so I think, you know, the, the narrative of the last cycle was all about this urbanization trend that Brad talked about. But really, we saw in the data that even as early as about 2015, the rate of uh, population growth in urban areas in the major metros in the US was slowing considerably and it was accelerating in suburban areas. So that makes sense, you know, when you think about the demographic shifts occurring, you have a lot of millennials who are in their 30s now who are buying homes and having kids and moving to suburbs. So in many ways, this, you know, narrative, right, it was too extreme, you know, pre-COVID too, in the other direction. And that actually led to partly led to this issue we had with so much new supply just flooding into urban areas, right? Because the trend was all about just millennials wanting to live in urban areas. So now again, it's just, you know, the pendulum has swung back. It's all about suburban areas now. Um, again, you know, tying it into the broader shifts that have been occurring for a long time, it's true. There are a lot of people moving to the suburbs. In many cases, though, what we think is that it's probably pulled forward some of those moves that people around my age were going to make anyway in the next few years, and maybe COVID accelerated that. So we're not going to have the hard data yet for a while, but we really don't have enough data at this point to help us figure out how many of the COVID-induced moves you know, are temporary versus those that are going to be permanent. Mm -hmm. How, how quickly, I mean, each of your companies, how quickly are you thinking about shifting asset mixes and, uh, you know, sort of portfolio investments in response to, you know, some of this uh, acceleration of change, either into or out of uh, certain types of retail or into or out of certain types of residential, industrial, obviously. Do you see quick moves to dispose of assets, slow moves to dispose of assets that are viewed as sort of in non-core sectors? Well, I mean, it, again, we're, you know, the, the, um, the absence of volatility or the reduction of volatility versus the public markets that Brad talked about, the trade-off is, is illiquidity, right? So we, we, can't, we can't sell commercial properties, you, you know, overnight. So, you know, we're more strategic about that. And, and none of our three firms would be sort of a distressed seller. Uh, you will see situations where properties are over-levered. They can't make their debt service. Um, and there'll be those, those type of opportunities. Um, look, I, I think there's a reason why um, the institutional world is, is sometimes labeled as having a little bit of a herd mentality. Yeah, the, going into this, and again, it just exacerbated it, but you know, we were overweight industrial. We continue to be overweight industrial vis-a-vis uh, -vis the benchmark. 
Uh, we still like residential uh, and the different uh, subsectors of that. Uh, and we're underweight, you know, office and, and retail. So that's, that's how we're positioning the portfolio. Yeah, I would tell you, um, we felt pretty good about our portfolio construction broadly coming in. I think some of the uh, COVID related shifts that have, have, uh, we've benefited from because of that portfolio construction, but we're also, you know, we're on the margin, I would say opportunistically continuing to shift the portfolio um, into more healthcare real estate, into some of the alternative sectors that uh, we spoke about earlier because we see uh, better risk adjusted returns and frankly better uh, fundamentals in those spaces uh, with our outlook. Um, the, the challenge on the flip side on the uh, on reconstructing the portfolio to dispositions right now is uh, Mike's point getting out of unfavored assets uh, right now unfavored sectors um, you're gonna be faced with sort of a distressed pricing uh, in all likelihood um, and you know it might make sense to wait so you know the full portfolio construction might take some time until the capital markets improve for some of those assets yeah, please. I mean, you're about to say something. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of the the same themes, um, but you really just a continuation again of shifts we were trying to make in our portfolio pre-COVID and reinforcing a lot of those moves. Um, but it just you know it it takes a long time and there's so little price discovery in office and retail. And I think that what a lot of our investors face is this dilemma: if they want to reduce something like their overall retail exposure, the issue is what you can sell is probably the retail you would want to keep, which is the grocery anchor, the open air, you know, the malls are completely illiquid right now. So it's very, very challenging to figure out what to do with those. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting as a person that sits in our seat at JLL that helps to create liquidity for assets. These are all of the same conversations that we were having 12 and 16 months ago as it relates to where you wanted to be and how you wanted to be positioned. It sort of occurred to me listening to you talk about um, where you want to be and uh, how quickly you will move there is that, frankly, the COVID dynamic and the recession that we're in, it's the byproduct of that, probably actually slowed down some of the portfolio transition and reconstruction, which is really exactly what you'd expect to have happen and, and really is exactly what happened back in 2009 and 2010. We had delays in the execution of business plans that then ultimately led to quite a bit of transaction flows. You looked out into, you know, 11, 12, and 13, which we were betting people, which I guess to a degree we we're all betting people. We may be looking at the same types of trends looking out into 20, later 21, 22, and 23. So it's very, very interesting. Um, it, it does, you know, just to sort of shifting gears a little bit geographically, there was a, I just thought a great question uh, that one of us posed, and I'll let that person take credit for it if they choose to. Uh, but the question that was posed was if you um, were the CEO or the CEO, COO, of a major Fortune 500 company, and you were considering a uh, a move, and you had to pick the three cities, and you think about that as you know Western, Central, and Eastern districts that you would send your team out into the field to explore and test. What three cities? What three MSAs would you target, and why? I think that's a super interesting question for the world we're in right now. So I'll put it out to you. Whoever wants to speak first. It's please. a great. You know, it's a great question, Danny. Um, it's really a great question. Mike. <laughs> I'll sp I'll speak I speak to a consensus answer too. I mean, it, it, you know, with all due love for the for the you know New York, Chicago, and, and San Francisco, which is where our you know our our three corporate headquarters are. You know, your scouts would be looking in. You know, Phoenix, maybe Denver. Um, you know, probably somewhere in Texas, Dallas, Austin's great. Maybe a little bit hard logistically uh, with the airport, but a lot of love for Austin and. Um, you know, Atlanta or uh, or Miami or maybe Tampa and Florida. Um, so, that, you know, that kind of plays a little bit into the uh, the southern migration um, um, movement that's that's going on. But but why? That's really the interesting part of the question. Why why those? What would sort of drive the selection of those three markets, from a talent perspective or otherwise? I think Emmy the the, the would have an interesting perspective on that. Yeah. Well, so I disagreed, right? I was the outlier and my choices were unpopular. So, but I'll name them anyway. I I'm, loved your choices, by the way. 
So I'm taking the perspective, say, like a maybe a tech company, but you know, if I'm focused on my millennial workforce, like highly educated, I'm going to think about where do they want to live, you know, what kind of environments do they want to live and work in, how do I access the educated talent pool? So my choices were LA, Chicago, and Boston. I decided on Boston. So completely different. I guess I have an anti Sunbelt bias somewhat. And that's a really interesting topic we should touch on because obviously there's great migration trends there. Affordability is a huge issue in coastal gateway metros. On the other hand, you know, you have all these issues of things like climate risk, right, that are increasing in the Sun Belt. So, you know, it's a really interesting time where all the momentum seems to be going to the Sun Belt for sure. Um, but again, those, those would not be my choices. I think that's it depends I heard on that. the nature of the company, the size of the company, uh, the nature of their workforce uh, and the talent that they're trying to attract um, and, you know, what that company does, right? If you're, if you're a tech company, uh, you're probably likely to lean more towards someplace like Austin or Denver. Um, and, but if you've got a huge workforce and you need a, a world-class airport to get anywhere in the world international, then you're going to probably lean towards someplace like Dallas or Atlanta, where you've got a much more diverse workforce um, and an airport that can get, you know, your people anywhere in the world pretty easily. Now, would you expect that company to, to locate on a, on a tower basis or in a suburban campus uh, basis? Well, I, I, I mean, I, you know, a lot of people talk about the Spoken Hub model and how COVID is going to be a, a boom a little bit for the for suburban office. I, I My personal opinion on that is that the suburban experience is competing with the home office experience and that, you know, business companies have proven that people can work out of their homes when they need to be remote. Um, so personally, I, I believe in a in an urban office, you know, headquarter uh, location where people would meet for the collaboration, the culture, the coaching um, that 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 the company wants. I, I do think we're going to a, a more flexible workforce for sure. Just because it's interesting, and there was actually a, a version of this question that popped up on one of maybe one or both of the chats, um, and it was one of the things that I think we wanted to chat about. How does sort of long long duration climate uh, climate change issues and how do how do sort of ESG driven issues drive? I, I think moving past putting yourselves in the shoes of a Fortune 500 CFO, CEO, excuse me, how, how thinking now as a CIO, how do you think about sort of the forward looking DCF as it relates to potential climate risk or other ESG related issues? And is it guiding your investing right now? Maybe Brad, that would be a good one for you to open up with. Yeah, um, I'd say, it, I wouldn't say it's, it's driving our investment, uh, but it's definitely a factor uh, and an important factor in our decision-making process. We're, uh, we're committed to uh, reducing the carbon footprint across our portfolio. Um, the uh, climate risk is uh, something that we evaluate with every investment. Uh, we think that... Uh, you know, you need to construct your portfolio appropriately relative to those risks. And that might mean, you know, being underweight to a place like Miami um, and overweight to other areas that, uh, that have less climate risk um, and really evaluating the sustainability of every, uh, every investment that you're making uh, individually. So uh, it's definitely... We have an ESG checklist we go through uh, on every deal. We have a climate risk score that is presented on every investment committee memo. Um, and so that's part of the overall uh, decision-making process with respect to whether to proceed with that investment. Yeah. And Mike, you're, you're in the development business. You're going to underwrite and program a super core 550-unit uh, apartment tower in a market. Um, and you're going to hold that deal for 10 years and then sell it to someone else who's going to hold it for 10 or 15 years. Are you, are you looking out 20, 25 years into the future as to what their exit might look like from a climate risk perspective? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an easy decision from a ground up or a, or a repositioning perspective because you have the opportunity. I mean, look, 40% of carbon emissions come from buildings. It's a huge focus. It's harder to retrofit a building. And there's different uh, different alignment of interest with with expense share between landlord and tenant and so forth. But when you're building 
you know, something new. Our, our position has been this way since 2006 or for a long time, 15 years has been that, you know, if you're going to make it a class A, you know, rental building, like you described, or office building, that it needs to be green uh, and you should build it that way. And there's certain standards that, you know, that we can build to and get this commissioning certification for. So it's um, kind of a no brainer from a development perspective. Yeah, I didn't want to skip you if you had any commentary on this because it's a, a very hot topic in our circles right now. Um, I was on another panel similar to this, and I, we spent we wanted spending half the time on climate change and uh, climate change and ESG. It was fascinating. Yeah, so I would add to what Brad said. We have a similar process, but you know, you also think about it in different dimensions of climate risk, and some of them are more imminent than others, right? So again, with some of these things, you know, it's we can say 20 or 30 years in the future, maybe, you know, there are going to be climate migrants within the U.S. and that's going to benefit Chicago or some of the northern cities. But there are also other climate risks that we're seeing already, including sea level rise, wildfire risk. So you have to assess those risks uh, separately, right, and kind of cap exposure to any one dimension of those risks in the same way that you diversify your portfolio geographically, you know, and in other ways. Um, and then when you're thinking about that long-term hold, again, some of those risks are likely to come up sooner than others. Well, so why don't we shift gears again, uh, just in the interest of kind of keep, keeping the discussion moving, knowing that we want to save some time for questions at the end, which I see are starting to come in. Um, maybe talk a little bit about allocations and how you're targeting structured investments. And I think the two major questions that I'd have for the group there is, um, are you, are you, directing your investors to look at more core, more core plus, more value add or opportunistic investing, number one. And number two, are you thinking more about uh, structured finance and debt? Um, and are your investors demanding more structured finance and, uh, and debt investment vehicles uh, that you, you might create to, to invest on their behalf as an alternative to fixed income? Uh, those are a couple of things that we talk about quite a bit and be curious for the group's reaction to it. I know you all have debt funds, so. Um, I guess the first part of that question is a little tougher to answer because yeah. most investors, as you uh, are speaking with them, have sort of, it, from a risk profile standpoint, they, they've sort of identified where they want to play in the market. So uh, you're sort of advising them on, uh, you know, which products or and or which sectors to play in. Um, and then... So if you if you just look at setting aside what LaSalle does, but you just look at where capital raise uh, has been recently, it's sort of the barbell approach to that risk spectrum where you know, a lot of money has flowed into structured debt products where you're sort of, you know, you're, you're protecting downside. Um, and then the other side of that spectrum targeting the higher return, the, the you know, the value added, the opportunistic. And so the void lately has been sort of in that middle sort of core, core plus space within the, at least within the risk spectrum. Yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, we talk about core, you know, real estate, you know, it's typically we mean buying a, a building that's, you know, leased up and, and sort of a um, lower risk, lower return, uh, return proposition, which generally our investors is institutional investors are more, you know, risk adverse. I'm a development person, so I like the development risk. I like, you know, owning at a true cost basis and being able to build state of the art. Um, and again, this, the, the, there's risk in development and, and and a lot of our investors are annuity driven. So they have to wait a little bit for that, for the, that annuity to come in. Um, you know, and kind of relate, you know, so it, to, to Brad's point, you know, like, uh, at Reef, we started a, an industrial fund specific to the industrial sector that's called the Reef Core Plus Industrial Fund. There's really actually no kind of core plus at the asset level. I mean, maybe you raise a roof or, you know, but there's core and there's development. So that's why we call it, you know, core plus. So it's kind of a hybrid approach, you know, of those two. But we're, we're definitely seeing, you know, I think because of the competitiveness for the core product and how competitive the pricing, uh, people are looking at the spreads for, for building um, in specific sectors like the residential and industrial and our, um, are, are you know are more more apt to invest in that um so that that that's reflective of today's world yeah and i, and I think mike i mean we talk about this all the time right? and i think you see it every day it's very hard to buy true core right now because 
the owners of those properties don't don't tend to want to sell them. They tend to want to hold them because they're very hard to come by. And so, you know, you, your your job is to go find ways to develop to those core assets. And then, uh, to, to, not to dismiss debt, um, you know, there there has been an emergence of sort of non traditional, um, you know, debt funds um, with the lenders, kind of you know, traditional lenders, the banks, and the life insurance companies, and tighten up a bit. That that again is another kind of non core strategy to. To play in the in the capital stack, which you know, Danny, you do a lot of, um, so that that is a growing uh, investment uh, option too. Yeah, I mean, what one of the fundamental shifts we've seen over the course of you know the last twenty years is the uh, both the investment uh, the equity investments business as well as the debt business has really gone to an advised model, and as you've seen, advisors proliferate on the equity investing side. They've the natural progression from a uh, building of AUM perspective is to also advise as it relates to debt and all of the, not all, but most of the insurance companies at this point have set up uh, independent advisory businesses that advise their own general accounts as well as the accounts of others and as have the traditional slate of, of equity uh, investment advisors, whether it's LAM, Heitman, or, uh, or Deutsche Bank Reef or DWS, excuse me, too many names. So that's it, and it is it, one of the byproducts of that is it has introduced really tremendous liquidity and really sticky liquidity across the full spectrum of both equity and debt investing uh, domestically as well as abroad. So I think that that is really the topic we're talking about and pretty interesting for a, a group of CFAs out, out in the audience that really track capital flows and how, those, how that capital is, is advised and managed. Um, let's see, why don't, um, why don't we chat a little bit on the uh, return side? Any, you know, we're, we're in a compressing, or we had been in a compressing interest rate environment. The, uh, I think the verdict is out right now as to exactly where particularly long dated rates are going, but how has, um, how has the, the broader rate environment impacted your view on target returns uh, and the target returns you, you, and, and risk adjusted returns? Maybe Brad, you could sort of kick that off and we can throw it around the horn sure. a little bit. Yeah, my view is um, we're in a we are in a low risk uh, environment. The risk free rate is low, and in an efficient market, uh, you you know investments should should be your expected return should be a spread over that risk free rate. So with a risk free rate low, your expected return uh, on any asset class ought to be uh, also low from a historic standard level. And I think we're seeing that in the marketplace and we're comfortable with that. The offset to that is, uh, is the use of leverage. And uh, you might on an unlevered basis, sort of an all cash look at something, the return's gonna look pretty low, but when you can borrow it, you know, 2% versus a year ago, that was three and a half, um, you know, you can make up some of that uh, return uh, via your levered equity return. So, but we're definitely seeing across the board especially with uh, some of the asset classes growth profile being a little bit more muted from, uh, from past cash flow projections. Um, the terms are definitely lower uh, today than they were 18 months ago. Yeah. Mike, how have you seen that manifest itself in terms of development yields and target development IRRs? It actually would be interesting to hear your thoughts regionally on that topic. Yeah. I mean, the, um, you know, like a lot of asset classes, and again, pegging off the the, the risk free rate. I mean, the total return expectations and you know development is marked to core. So you, you sort of look at your core option and and your and your cost to build versus what you're buying at. And uh, you know, so ten year total returns in the core space are somewhere in the five to six percent uh, ten year total return before before debt. And then depending on how much leverage you want to put up, put on it, you can boost your returns. But again, the institutions don't leverage very much. Um, a, a development is um, underwritten to a you know, typically a you know shorter term hold period, um, and so you know, you're looking at probably you know low double digit you know returns before debt, and hopefully you're in the 14 to 16 percent you know leverage. You put a, you typically uh, you put more leverage on a development project. Um, you know, we average about 60 percent if we don't provide the debt ourselves, um, and then. And then to your question about uh, regionally, and I'll just kind of speak to the industrial and residential space because that's that's where most of the activity is. And we're certainly not building new shopping centers um, in the real estate world. 
You don't want to do a mall? No, more malls. Um, the most competitive uh, return environment would be in uh, in the Pacific Northwest for an industrial. The Kent Valley is very competitive. Um, you know, California. It's very difficult to get projects uh, entitled there. So, you know, real good industrial or uh, residential in California is going to be your lowest return. And then the the Northeast is also very competitive. Uh, and then Florida. Florida doesn't have a lot of available um, developable uh, industrial and, and, and residential sites. So those are kind of the, the most competitive uh, lowest. So how, does it, how does a development yield in one of those top, top markets compare just differential in, in basis points to a slightly less competitive market, you know, developing an industrial property in um, the Northwest versus, you know, industrial property in uh, Pittsburgh? Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a the return, a bad example. I think the return on cost is probably the best metric. So that's your yep. first year of income over your costs. Uh, you know, I'd say you could get somewhere between a, you know, call it, give or take a 75 basis point spread between, but that, you know, that would be between the markets, the 25 or so markets that we would invest in. So it's even higher if you're in secondary or tertiary markets. Maybe. Brad, same same question for you on the existing side, core apartment building in, um, uh, I don't know if you're investing in Tampa, Florida, but you know, a Tampa, Florida versus in Atlanta, Georgia, or a, um, a Boston, uh, Massachusetts from your perspective. Yeah, I would tell you um, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, I think the second, I would say both on the industrial side and the residential side, the uh, demand uh, for secondary markets from investors has increased substantially. And I would say, you know, 18 months ago, maybe you were looking at a uh, 75 basis point spread from a Tampa to uh, uh, Atlanta or uh, Atlanta to a Boston maybe, but that spread, those spreads have compressed materially. Maybe you're getting 25 basis points differential uh, right now, but probably nothing more than that. Yeah. We, we, talk, we talk a lot about, you know, whether the cash flow is, is sort of fortress in nature. And if you can buy fortress cash flow in Tampa, it's uh, just as valuable as fortress uh, cash flow in, in Atlanta um, and sort of that durability concept. Uh, whereas where you really do see the valuation disparities is when there are real questions demographically or otherwise, supply pipelines, et cetera, as it relates to the durability of, of those cash flows. So it very much ties to, I think, a lot of the things that we're hearing more broadly. So, I mean, then just sort of shifting gears to, and maybe just for a couple of more minutes before we do a final topic, a any thoughts, just given that we're, you know, sort of hitting, hitting recessionary cycle right now, bottom of the cycle, arguably, how are you thinking about putting projections together, looking out over the next uh, three to four years until we get into more of an inflationary growth pro forma perspective, whether it's an acquisition or development, just growth factors on revenues, growth factors on expenses? I don't know, Emmy or Mike, any, any thoughts on those to kind of kick that part of the discussion off? I'd say from a kind of revenue and rent growth perspective, right. obviously it varies regionally um, and by property sector, but in the ones where you we do expect some better growth, um, you know, we're starting to feel comfortable having some pretty big rent growth projections in industrial based on, you know, the recent data that we're seeing, we have better visibility into actual lease rates. Mm -hmm. um, and the forecasts are pretty amazing. If you actually look at like the CoStar other forecasts, I mean, you're seeing high high single digit, you know, annual rent growth numbers in markets like Philadelphia, Northern New Jersey. So speaking to I think Brad's point about some of these secondary tertiary industrial locations really booming. On the apartment side, right, it's a little tougher because A, it's hard to determine when you should underwrite a rebound in urban apartment rents right, because a lot of that's dependent on the vaccine and when people return to work. And then the other side of it is the places that have seen the really strong momentum that we talked about, like the Sunbelt cities. I mean, some of them are just seeing massive amounts of supply in the pipeline, right? Those have only gotten bigger. So that makes it really hard when you're looking at an Austin or a Nashville and you're seeing that there's four or 5% of existing stock is under construction today. You know, how do you how do you approach that going forward? So we've been a little more focused on some of the markets that have been pretty solid performers, um, but aren't seeing as much new supply there. 
you know, I mean, related to that, it's 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 cyclical, right? I mean, the it's 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 geographically specific and sector specific. So, you know, if Emmy gave us you know rent forecast for you know Midtown New York office right now, you know, over the next year or two, it, you know, it would be pretty muted. Uh, same for San Francisco, and what that'll mean is that uh, less new buildings will get built. Um, you know, the vacancy will get absorbed, and then landlords will be able to to push you know rents. Um, and conversely in the markets where there's good growth. And I mean, you know, there's, there's markets where there is a lot of supply, like a market like Austin has a lot of supply, Nashville has a lot of supply. There's also a lot of, you know, growth that goes along with it too. And um, I think Austin has been a good example for, you know, quite a while now um, that, that the demand has been able to keep pace, you know, with the supply. Um, and so um, it really it really varies across you know across the country. And that's why I would say all three of our companies have research uh, 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 segments that uh, really dive into the fundamentals of that sector in that market and forecast supply and demand and what that uh, impact is on rent. So it's really it's really sort of case by case, but it's even more challenging now than ever particularly with something like office, uh, I think, where there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly around the demand forecast. Yeah, I mean, for the audience, just yeah, what you're really hearing is just the professionalization and institutionalization of uh, private commercial real estate investing, you know, has, again, been one of those mega trends over the last 25 years that has caused the capital base that underlies private real estate investing to just become much more sticky, much more stable and consistent over long cycles. Uh, it's not, not a market like it was back in the 1970s where it was you know, an insurance company that would come in and out of the market for particularly private syndications and things of that nature that could be very illiquid and very undercapitalized. And so you know, very consistent with this panel, we've got a set of institutional investors that have very thoughtful and thorough processes involved in making their investments and then managing them from a fiduciary perspective. So it is a very different market than the one that existed when I think Speak for myself, the five of us came into this business uh, many years ago. Um, just, you know, to wrap things up for, from a panel perspective, you know, and take it closer to home. Uh, we all live in Chicago. You all have portfolios in Chicago. How, how, have, how have your Chicago portfolios held up and uh, are you happy you own them? Maybe that's too loaded a question, but why not? Um, um, go ahead, go Mike. Ahead. Lots of ums. Well, we, you know, one of the things uh, as leadership that the pandemic has introduced an increased focus on is, is collections. Um, I don't think we've all paid as much attention and given as much, you know, of our time and energy to collections as we have through the pandemic. So, um, so you ask about the fundamentals, you know, the, I would say the, the, the Chicago properties, you know, have done a good job collecting our rents. Um, you know, we have our biggest challenges and I, I, we're probably not alone with this uh, as an industry in, in California. Um, so, you know, people in Chicago um, feel obligated to, to pay their rent. Um, I think that, um, you know, we haven't, we, 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 did, uh, we did sell an asset, uh, we have sold a couple assets into the pandemic. So we had pretty, pretty decent liquidity um, they were sort of, uh, localized buyers. Um, I wouldn't say we, we have a ton of international capital that's investing right now. Uh, and then the big question is kind of what is the, what are the rent growth prospects, you know, going, going forward for Chicago? Um, we, um, we've got quite a bit of new office space that's on the market as a city, um, that, uh, that, that'll need to be absorbed before landlords will be able to really push rent. Um, and we've built quite a bit of, of, as anybody knows who drives around the city, we've built quite a bit of high rise uh, apartment projects too. Um, so, you know, uh, again, that supply has to be, has to be absorbed to, in order to have, you know, pricing power as a landlord. Yeah, I would say, I think Mike's right. Uh, you know, if you just focus on collections in terms of how much of your uh, tenant base is actually paying you rent, Chicago and other Midwest markets have held up really well compared to some other markets. Um, and uh, Chicago, I don't think is unlike other urban transit oriented cities in terms of the challenges that it's having with 
uh, both office and residential in the urban core. Um, we had supply issues, as Mike referenced, both on residential and we have it on office. Office is going to lag a little bit uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when rents will decline um, as that vacancy comes online and a lot of the sublease comes online. And then when, uh, when tenants and landlords actually start consummating leases, which has been uh, almost non-existent over the last nine to 12 months. Uh, the residential side, you're you're leasing every day, and you're seeing your occupancy uh, fluctuate every day. Recently, fluctuating down, um, so it's been a challenge on the urban residential side, um, but no different than a Boston or a San Francisco or a New York. Um, the bigger picture with Chicago is, uh, and frankly, the way that you should look at real estate performance overall is kind of the long-term performance uh, of it. Uh, in terms of relative, whether it's relative to a benchmark or uh, or rent growth, which helps drive investment returns, and that's where I think Chicago lags a lot of the other uh, a lot of the other cities around around the country, regardless of what asset class you're talking about. And I think it's partly due to supply issues uh, and fundamentals, and you know, partly due to you know a little bit weaker investor demand for Chicago due to some of the fiscal concerns uh, that. that that uh, most investors view uh, as a real challenge for Chicago's growth going forward. Yeah, I mean, what, what, you know, both, both uh, Brad and Mike commented that uh, collections held up so well. I mean, from an, uh, do, you, do you tie that to sort of affordability or, uh, you know, a less uh, mobile population base? What are your thoughts on that? Well, a few things. I think Brad's right that um, the trend has been similar to a lot of other major metros. So, you know, throughout the pandemic, you know, we were tracking collections all the time. And it was kind of astonishing, right, the way that apartment collections, student housing, even when students weren't on campus, yep. those collections held up so well, pretty much across the board. Um, and we kept waiting for it to fall off. You know, I think one thing we attributed it to is that, you know, we, we generally had kind of class A apartments. Um, and so that was a higher income renter who maybe had more cushions and savings, didn't lose their jobs, they could work remotely. Um, so certainly I think that was a component of it. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about the affordability dynamic of Chicago um, where Downtown apartment rentals, you know, they're generally 15 to 18% uh, rent to income levels in Chicago. You try, and, and generally speaking, those are occupants that are taking um, 750 to 850 square feet per human being. You sort of translate that to New York math, and it could be 50% rent to income levels and two to 250 square feet per person. So the trade offs were just much, much more dramatic in a market like uh, Manhattan than a market like Chicago, much easier. Um, much easier city to live in and to continue to pay rent in because there isn't that trade-off. I do think that accounts for it. And the question is, will that affordability index really benefit Chicago on a go-forward basis, looking you know, well past the recession and into the recovery? You know, from a job growth perspective, do we attract those employers that will continue to drive population growth here that may be attracted to, I think echoing a lot of the points everyone in this panel made earlier, We've got great public transit, we've got great airport, we've got great natural resources and environmental sustainability. I mean, a, I'm looking at a big lake out of my window or close to out of my window right now, but I am looking at the river, which I would not recommend drinking. Um, but there are a lot of things that you could sort of cast a rel relatively positive argument for. Just some serious headwinds as it relates to, I think as Brad and Mike and Emmy put it, the, the, the sort of fiscal overhang and public policy issues. So. Well, you know, we're about at, uh, at time. Um, I'm just looking to see if there were any interesting uh, questions that popped up that were interesting um, and that we could be well informed to answer. Um, and I'll just to give, you know, I'll read some of them off just to sort of reflect on what, what, what questions have been answered. I mean, this is interesting. Um, if not, if not proprietary, could the panel discuss their ESG research process? Uh, if anyone has a, that puts everyone on the spot. If anyone has a quick and interesting answer to that question, I don't. I don't know that it's a pure ME research question. I think it's more of a, um, 
you know, uh, a, a sort of policy question? Yeah, I mean, we, we say that, you know, ESG is in our, in our DNA. Um, so it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of part of what, what, what we do. Obviously, as I talked about on the building side, uh, and then separately we have, you know, we have ESG funds that you can invest in, in uh, specifically. Yeah, I'd say we, we have a global head uh, of uh, ESG and sustainability, um, as well as regional reps uh, in all three of our major regions that we operate in. Uh, we talked about uh, our ESG checklist and there's, uh, there's benchmarking globally. Uh, there's a major benchmarker called Presby that uh, scores portfolios that are willing to contribute their data uh, to it. So we're an active contributor on all of our large diversified portfolios to see how we stack up uh, against uh, the marketplace. Yeah, so we, um, I think, have a similar process as Brad. You know, we have, we partner with a company called 427. I think so we have a separate ESG function as well. Um, and each investment is evaluated on all of those dimensions of risk that I mentioned. And so we have thresholds for what kind of risk score you know, any one property can have and how high a given portfolio can get on all of those dimensions of climate risk. As I said uh, a few moments ago on this panel, I, I was on a panel that was intended to be capital markets driven and uh, all anyone wanted to do on that panel was to talk about ESG as well as diversity and inclusion. I mean, it is, you know, really for the right reasons, monopolizing a tremendous amount of time and creative thought uh, at, at the C-suite level and then throughout our, our organizations right now. And I know we're all trying to grapple with how to make our business more sustainable, number one, and number two, make our businesses look a lot more like the, uh, the broader country and world at large, which, you know, historically we've not done a great job of within the private commercial real estate industry. So it, I, I know I can speak for all of us when, when I say it's a major focus that we've all got fundamental initiatives built around. Um, there was a question that popped up um, that I thought was interesting and probably is a little bit outside of the sort of expertise of this group, but more, more an opinion, uh, an opportunity to give an opinion. Um, any thoughts on this? So the question reads, any thoughts on the popularity of retail investment vehicles like Cadre, CrowdStreet, Robinhood, and then maybe also sort of fitting into that, um, you know, some of the sort of private REIT work uh, that a lot of your companies are doing that do, uh, you know, give access to, um, yeah, non pension fund investors, et cetera. I don't know, any, any sort of broad thoughts on some of those vehicles? I, I personally have seen them at work and they're fascinating. But I didn't know if any of you had on the crowdsourcing side. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't really speak to the crowdsourcing side. I mean, I, the, 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 the private REIT world for the retail investor is, you know, kind of what we, for what we, the reasons that we talked about trading the liquidity for volatility, um, the private REITs tend to be uh, more income driven. Um, and buying, you know, triple net leases or more uh, stable income producing products. And that's been uh, sort of the institutionalization and the, and the reporting in, uh, of, of that product uh, has, has been well received by the market. And, you know, you've seen in look that the consumer has, uh, the individual investor has twice the buying power of the institution. So it's a huge sector and, um, and um, it's doing well. Yeah, I think the other key for that sector, and again, I, I would probably speak more to the private REIT model, uh, which is what some people would call 2.0 or 3.0 of that model. The, the key to that is, uh, is liquidity. Um, and the new model of the private REIT has figured out a way to provide investors liquidity on a regular basis. Uh, the old model you basically tied up your cash and it was, it was illiquid until the sponsor decided to, you know, uh, effectuate some sort of capital event. Whereas now, you know, the portfolios are valued, ours is valued on a daily basis and you can put in a redemption quest any given day and redeem out at that day's value. So um, that was huge uh, for the retail investor, right? If they're, if they're looking at liquidity as being a big, concern uh, and their alternative might have historically been the public REIT sector if they wanted to get exposure to real estate. Um, now they've got a mousetrap to invest in private real estate, get the stability and low volatility that Mike mentioned, 
but also have uh, some liquidity uh, to go along with it. So it's been a really successful uh, uh, option for retail or private investors. The, the other big sort of democratizing factor is just the uh, re dramatic reduction in the load uh, that's applied to that money in terms of, you know, in, invest a dollar and you're really putting 95 uh, cents to work. So, so that, that has been a major trend over the last several years, that, that private rate 3.0, as, as, as I think Brad rightly put it. So we are, I'm just looking to see if there are other questions. We're sort of coming to the, uh, the top of the hour. And um, I think we're just about to, to sort of be, be out of time. And I wanted to use that unless anyone else on the panel had anything else to contribute or add. Yeah, to obviously, to, to, I wanted to thank a few people. Uh, I obviously wanted to thank our panelists. So Emmy, Mike, and Brent, thank you for dedicating some of your time to this. It, it was really fantastic. And I want to thank Blake Schaefer, uh, one of my colleagues here at JLL, for uh, helping to organize this on behalf of the, uh, the CFA Society. So thank you so much, Blake, for really doing a great job of getting us all organized because we, we probably couldn't tie our shoes without, without your help. So thanks a million for that. And uh, obviously thanks uh, to everyone that turned up to, uh, to listen to us talk about things that we think we know something about, but probably know very little about. We're grateful to all of you for, for joining and for asking questions. We were able to uh, cover a handful of those questions and obviously look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon. Thanks everybody.